Hello, and welcome to Wall Street Trainings, module on corporate valuation methodologies. My name is Hamilton Lin, president and founder of Wall Street Training, and I have a background in investment banking and mergers and acquisitions, having worked at Goldman Sachs' Investment Banking Research, Bank of America Securities' Mergers and Acquisitions Group, and several other boutique investment banks, all focused on mergers and acquisitions. Please note that these materials are copyrighted and may not be disseminated or reproduced without express written approval from Wall Street. So then another question becomes, do you want to include capital leases? Capital leases. Let's take a look at capital leases. What are capital leases? Well, leases that are capital. That is how we would describe what a capital lease is. Now, what exactly does a lease that's capital mean? Well, folks, think about this. The accounting definition of capitalize simply means what? What does capitalize mean in accounting? This means put on balance sheet. So on the one hand, we have, of course, the flip opposite of capital leases, and that will be an operating lease. And this operating lease, what is an operating lease? It's simply a lease or rent. Let's say I have a $4,000 copier, and I choose to uh, pay, let's say, $1,000 a year for four years, so I don't have to own this copier. I will take this copier and I'll rent it for $4,000. On the flip side, if you meet certain accounting rules, you have to capitalize or put this on the balance sheet as if you bought it. As if you bought it. This doesn't mean you bought it. It's still a lease. It's still rental. However, the accountants want you to say, if you meet one of these four criteria, which we'll quickly go over, if you bought it, then you have to capitalize in the balance sheet so your assets via PP&E will actually increase and your liabilities, capital lease liabilities, will also increase. Let's just say hypothetically by $4,000 each. Now the accounting behind capital, operating, capital leases and the split of imputed interest and depreciation is actually a little bit more complex. So just note that we are going to simplify this analysis. So the question becomes, why is capital leases, why are capital leases not ideal? Generally speaking, this shows a higher asset base. If the asset base is higher, and if you recall from our accounting module, this means that you will show lower efficiency and lower asset management turnover ratios. Lower efficiency and lower asset management turnover ratios. So that is why we generally try to get this off the balance sheet to reduce our capital base. So for instance, return on assets might be a little bit lower. Also, because now you have a liability, a quote unquote debt that appeared on the books, this will also affect your capital ratios and this will show that you have more debt. And we, of course, do not like to show the fact that we have more debt. So for these two basic reasons, generally speaking, firms do not like to have to capitalize their lease because you have, again, lower efficiency ratios, lower asset management turnover ratios, such as return on assets, and of course, you now have to show additional debt. Now, if we have said that capital leases are not a good, are not necessarily ideal, what are the four reasons, one of four reasons that you would need if you meet any one of these four, you have to now capitalize the lease, treat this operating lease as if you bought it, put it on the balance sheet. So here we will say if you are a snob, you will basically have to capitalize this lease. A snob, 75% of your useful life. For instance, if this copier had a useful life of five years and I decided to lease it for four years, that is, uh, what is that, 80%. So therefore, the accountants say, well, you are effectively buying or using the entire life or 75% of it and therefore you are not going to be able to get away with just treating this as an operating lease. It's as if you bought it because you're substantially using a huge amount of the useful life. N stands for 90% of fair market value. Folks, if this lease is, um, if this copier is a $4,000 lease and in total, let's say I'm paying $3,800, assuming 38 over 4,000 is greater than 90%, they're saying, hey, it's as if you effectively paid for the entire copier you must now capitalize this, treat it as if you bought it. O stands for ownership. If there's a transfer of ownership, if the transfer of ownership at the end of this, free and clear, at the end of this operating lease, it is yours, then again, they treat it as if you bought it. Finally, if there's a bargain purchase price, for instance, at the end of the lease terms, you can buy it for $100 or a dollar, it's yours, free and clear. Again, if you meet any one of these four criteria, the Accountants will say to you, you have to make sure or you have to capitalize this lease as if you purchased the entire asset. Now, if we have proven that this capital lease and, the, and uh, operating lease, the only difference, again, the only difference between this capital and this operating lease is the mere fact of these random, quote unquote, random four accounting rules as dictated by the FASB, the Financial Accounting Statements Board. 
The FASB had these four rules, these snob rules. So what we are saying is from an economic perspective and from a financial analysis perspective, from an economic and financial analysis perspective, the difference between an operating lease and a capital lease is nothing. No difference between a capital and an operating lease. And if there is no difference between an operating and a capital lease, then we are going to effectively treat the capital lease as if it were an operating lease. Now, I know some of you may be thinking, well, we do actually want to include capital leases. We do want to include the effect of capital leases, or rather on the operating lease side, we want to say maybe we should add the operating lease back. But again, keep this in mind. When we are looking at enterprise value, going back to the context of this now, when we are looking at enterprise value, what we are ultimately trying to capture is the sources of funds from the financing perspective that I used to gain all of my assets. Whereas an operating lease is still an operating-related decision. I need to make photocopies. It's not a financing decision. Now, one could say, well, this capital lease, you needed to fund this copy or something. If you didn't lease it, rent it, you would have to buy it and you would have to borrow money potentially to do that. I can't argue with that approach necessarily, but the idea there again is that's an operating related decision for that particular decision on whether or not I needed to run my operations, make photocopies, etc. But what we're trying to capture again is the financing aspect. How did I grow my business initially? How did I, where did I get all the sources of capital I needed to actually grow and build my business? So therefore, we want to look at it from a financing perspective, whereas this capital lease is still an operating-related decision. I need it for my day-to-day -day operations as opposed to how do I fund the growth of my business. Slightly, slight subtle nuance there, but again, keeping this in context of the enterprise value calculation, that is why we want to make sure that here we want to include minority interest. So on the top here, you can add another box and say minority interest because why do we want to include minority interest as a summary? Again, we want to include minority interest because this is another form of capital used to get 100% of our profitability and our balance sheet because why? Greater than 50%, we have to consolidate. Likewise, we want to make sure we exclude or rather do not include the effect of capital leases because the difference between a capital and operating lease is purely an accounting definition. And because this is an accounting definition, it does not impact our ability to fund the growth of our business through the financing related activities. So folks, please make sure that you solidly understand this concept of enterprise value. Because at the end of the day, whenever we value companies, we always want to value the enterprise value. Then minus the net debt, minority interest, and preferred stock to then get us down to net income, uh, sorry, to equity value. Go from enterprise value, minus net debt, preferred and minority interest gets us to equity value. Then from equity value, divide by the appropriate number of shares outstanding, which will then get us our price per share. We rarely want to go the other way up when we're trying to value a standalone company. So this constant enterprise value, it's the entire firm, the entire enterprise is what I'm acquiring, not just the equity component.